Hello everyone. My name is Magda Matake and I'm a justice scholar and activist from Romania. I'm a Harvard instructor and I also work with the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University as the director of the Roma program. I'm also a descendant of Romani slaves. My research and teaching focus on the history and manifestations of anti-Romani racism and the global history of race and racism. In this lecture, I will discuss the history of Roma slavery in the territories of present-day Romania and the tactics that enslavers used to justify this system of exploitation and domination. I will engage with the global scholarly literature on slavery and reparations through a Romani lens, suggesting possible ways to heal and ensure reparations for the harm of Roma enslavement. Instances of Roma slavery have been documented in other parts of Europe and in the transatlantic slave trade. But for this presentation, I'm narrowing my remarks to focus on the history of Roma slavery in Romania. To begin, I suggest that in discussing slavery as a concept and practice, we examine it beyond the conventional legal constructs of ownership or property. Thus, I will unpack slavery as both an institutional process and a personal relation. Slavery was only present throughout history in all corners of the world. In societies including ancient Greece, Enlightenment Europe, or colonial North America, Slavery existed and flourished in parallel with the birth of doctrines on human virtues and on the rights and equality of all people. And throughout the history of slavery, we can see that enslavers, ideologies, laws and practices portrayed and acted upon slaves both as non-humans or objects and as persons who are legally and morally accountable. His labor saw no paradox in denying the humanity of slaves by exploiting and abusing them as non-persons, and at the same time, accounting for slaves as persons in law to respond to what the law and enslavers considered illegal and immoral acts by the slaves. Moreover, some categories of Roman slaves were also required to pay a so-called gypsy tax. In fact, there was no clash between these contradictory principles of treating slaves both as non-humans and as persons in law, because along with other tactics, this set of practices helped enslavers maintain not only total power over slaves, but also the condition of slavery. Furthermore, along with the enslavers, many other categories of people, philosophers, artists, writers, churches, and scientists contributed to creating false moral, philosophical, scientific, and legal justification to legitimize slavery, the denial of humanity, and the refusal to apply virtues and rights for enslaved peoples. In looking at Roma slavery as an institutional process, we should start by examining but also by distinguishing between the origins and the sources of slavery. In other words, how did Romani people become slaves in the first place? And how did the enslaver acquire Romani slaves throughout the five centuries of enslavement? Orlando Peterson suggested eight mechanisms through which people become enslaved. They are capturing warfare, kidnapping, tribute and tax payment, debt, punishment for crimes, abandonment and sale of children, self-enslavement and birth. Scholars of Romani history do not agree on the way that Roma enslavement originated in the principalities of Moldova and Wallachia. What we do know is that the first written attestation of Roma slavery in these territories appeared 635 years ago. 
In October 1385, Dan I, the Prince of Wallachia, gifted the assets of the then closed Bodhisattva Monastery to Tismana Monastery. Those assets, which has been donated to Bodhisattva in the early 1370s by Prince Vladislav I, included 40 Romani families. This written record leads us to a source, a means of acquiring slaves, but not to the origins of Roma slavery. Some of the existing theories suggest that the original mechanisms for enslaving Roma was captured in warfare. It's not surprising that historians chose that explanation. In early medieval Europe, many of those enslaved were prisoners of war or were kidnapped or victims of pirates. Alexandru Gonta and other historians argued that when the Romanians were victorious in battles against the Tatars, who invaded the Romanian principalities in the 1200s, the Romanians captured Roma from the Tatars and then put them into slavery. On the other hand, Nicolae Gheorga suggested that Roma had already been slaves of the Tatars when the Romanians captured them in war and continued to keep them enslaved. And Nicolae Gheorghe emphasized that in 1471, Stefan the Great, the Prince of Moldova, brought 17,000 Romani slaves as captives after a victory against Wallachia. Yet importantly, he does not embrace the idea that slavery originated with capture in warfare. Instead, he argues that when Roma arrived on the territories of the two principalities, they were free people. But a century later, social and economic conditions led enslavers to force the Roma into slavery. And indeed, Romani people were not members of the dominant population in Wallachia who might be taken as prisoners of war. The 17,000 Romani people may have not been considered prisoners of war or human beings, but rather non-persons, commodities, or goods to be confiscated upon victory. And slavery had been documented in both Moldova and Wallachia since the 14th century. Thus, this example shows us one way that slaves were acquired and moved from one principality to another. An earlier historian, Petre Panaitescu, also argued that Roma were enslaved because of a critical need for labor, especially specialized labor such as blacksmithing, which some Romani groups had mastered. Other theories, especially those of Viorella Kim and Petre Pescu, prompt us to search elsewhere for the origins of Roma enslavement. Viorella Kim agrees that the institution of slavery was adopted in the Romanian principalities from the Tatars, and eventually the Romanians implemented it against the Tatars they captured in battle. But he argues that when Roma arrived in the Romanian principalities later in the 14th century as newcomers, outsiders, and nomads, they are also pulled into the existing system of slavery. And as the number of Tatars was very small in the 15th century, the Roma remained the only enslaved people. Petre Petkuts argues that the Orthodox Church played a crucial role in what he calls the birth of the institution of slavery in the Romanian principalities. Having accepted donations of huge estates in the 14th century, the church addressed its workforce needs by taking advantage of the Roma status as a people who were highly skilled, but were newcomers, outsiders, and not Christians. The union of the Christian church already had an established practice and tradition of enslaving various peoples, so Petkut's theory may build on that piece of history. He also shows that before the Roma arrived in the principalities, peasants who had worked for 12 years on a property would gain more status. So perhaps enslavers could have used promises or similar treatment to influence or trick the Roma into enslavement.
Nea Guciuvara argues that when small groups of Roma started to cross the Danube to Valachia in the 14th century, the crown and the nobility would immediately enslave them. In the Romanian principalities, we can distinguish three types of enslavers. The crown and later the state, the Orthodox Church, and the nobility. Respectively, we can see three categories of slaves. It is not clear which of these enslavers originated the Roma enslavement, but Akim suggested that at first, the prince must have been the only enslaver. And of course, at various times, some free Roma also self-enslaved by selling themselves in times of hunger or other great difficulties or pressure. But if we focus on the theories of Georgia, Juvara, and Petkut, we could argue that the origins of Roma enslavement may not fit exactly into Orlando Peterson's list of original means of enslavement. So we may need a new category in the list. Could we add deceit or coercion of newcomers who are non-white and non-Christian? And can we add power and a political project targeting the people newly arrived in a given territory? Similar to the situation in other parts of the world, ethnic Romanians must have been reluctant to enslave other ethnic Romanians. This made the Roma the obvious choice as a people who were neither white nor Christian. Plus, race and culture prejudice made it easier to justify enslaving them. Thus, as we consider ethnic distinctiveness or race as a factor in determining the condition and treatment of slaves, we should also consider it as a factor in people's reasoning for enslavement as one of the original reasons for enslaving Roma. And therefore, when discussing the history of anti-Romani racism, we have to start with this political project justified through cultural and race prejudice. In this sense, we have to understand anti-Romani racism not in the ways in which dominant majorities view Roma or so-called gypsies, but as a political project as Francisco Betancourt would call it, and a system of oppression and domination imposed through power and justified through race and cultural prejudice. Now, let me turn to the sources of slavery and how enslavers acquired Romani slaves throughout the 500 years of enslavement. By law, the enslavers owned the slaves as their property or possession. And any slave without a master would become the property of the crown. One major source of Romani slaves was the children born to enslaved parents. This was true in the majority of slaveholding societies. In both Moldova and Valachia, children became slaves at birth. As Delia Grigore describes, the fact of slavery at birth had a very significant impact on Romani women and girls. Called breeding females, they were seen as tools to increase the number of slaves. Children born of one free person and one slave were also to be enslaved. And enslaved children were separated from their parents when they were sold or donated, sometimes through slave fairs, to be exploited as laborers. But over time, especially starting in the 17th century, when written laws became more common, the enslavers imposed a variety of rules, laws, and taxes. Along with political and economic context and external influences, different laws and regulations impacted the way in which Romani slaves were acquired. For instance, starting in 1785 in Moldova, the law stipulated that a child born of one free person and one slave would be freed at birth. Furthermore, when enslavers were selling or donating Romani children, the law forbade them to separate the children from their families. In the 1830s, both principalities prohibited legal unions between free persons and slaves, but children born from such marriages were freed. And in the Roma case, 
up until 1856, when the final act of abolition was adopted, enslavers used skilled Romani slaves as a form of living currency, as well as private possessions, as they would sell, auction, gift, punish, torture, and abuse them. In the Romanian principalities, monasteries and nobility often acquired slaves through donations or gifts from the crown. The boyars gifted slaves to monasteries too, and in turn, the crown could confiscate slaves from these loyal boyars. But the crown would decide on the possession and allocation of slaves. Less commonly, the enslavers also organized slave fairs, where Romani families were dispersed through the sale of individual members. Still other methods were used to sell slaves. In a 1841 publication, a Swiss author wrote, Slavery is the country's greatest shame, a black stain in front of foreigners. Will you dare to count yourselves among the civilized people as long as it is possible to read in your newspapers for sale a young gypsy woman? The price of Romani slaves varied across time and depended on economic and social factors. The price of male and female slaves, as well as children, differed too. Petre Petkut calculated that from 1593 to 1653, male slaves generally fetched a higher price than female and child slaves did. And Orlando Pedersen discussed how across slaveholding societies, slaves functioned as multifunctional money understood as units of accounting or a standard of value, a method of payment, a medium of exchange, or a way to store wealth. And indeed, enslavers used Roman slaves as money. They treated them like any other valuable or possession and used them to make donations or to pay debts or mortgages. They also exchanged them for goods such as wine or animals. In 1689, as Adrian Fortuna documents, an enslaver justified the sale of a Romani child as follows. Because we needed a horse, we bought it from him with the money he gave us for the child who should remain property of Marco and his sons. They also used slaves as dowries and as offerings to churches to have a sin forgiven, and as gifts in memory of someone who had died. To conclude this section, I would like to emphasize that slavery constituted a central element in the development and growth of the Romanian economy. It was a critical source of wealth for the Romanian state, for the Orthodox Church, and for the Romanian aristocracy. Indeed, the forced labor of Romani people was massive. In fact, the institutions further used the process of abolition to ensure that Romani people, especially blacksmiths, stayed where they had been, as they were an irreplaceable and unique workforce. And so a large portion of the wealth gap in Romania stems from this history of economic exploitation, though little is known about it. Its effect on the Romanian Roma have not been well researched, as most quantitative research has focused on income poverty and multidimensional poverty. I would now like to turn to the condition of Roma slavery, particularly the relationship between enslavers and enslaved. We want to know, as Orlando Pedersen put it, and I quote, how slaves adjusted to their masters and to their new condition and how masters use their power in the relationship with the slave. Race played a relevant role in determining the condition and treatment of slaves. One of the most valued books on slavery, entitled Slavery and Social Death by Orlando Pedersen, examined 55 slaveholding societies and emphasized that 21% of them involved enslavers and enslaved people belonging to different racial groups. In the Romanian territories, the origins and skin color of the Roma 
made it possible to distinguish them as non-Romanians and non-Christians, vital elements in enslavement. And enslavers did justify the condition and the inhumane treatment of slaves to the racecraft of Romani criminality and inferiority. As Adrian Fortuna documents, in the 18th century, Dimitri Cantemir wrote this about Romani slaves. They have the same aspects and customs as the gypsies from other countries. Their most important characteristics and what distinguishes them from others are idleness and robbing. Thus, this currently widespread racist idea that gypsies are deceitful or criminal also has deep roots in the past of anti-Romani racism. It was already documented in 1639 in the name of a Valachian village, Tiganasca, a name derived from Tigan, a racial slur, and also a synonym for slaves in the Romanian principalities. The Tiganasca village gained that name because Romanian peasants, like enslaved Roma, had run away from exploitation and abuse. That escaping exploitation was conveniently for enslavers considered a Romani criminal act. Escaping exploitation contributed to the present idea of Romani criminality. But looking beyond race at the condition of slavery, we can observe that enslavers had total power in the relationship with Romani slaves. Enslavers had the power to treat and punish slaves as they wanted, although the law prohibited them from killing Roma. However, as the French journalist Felix Colson wrote upon traveling to slaveholding Romania, slaves were, and I quote, often shot through the head and flogged to death upon any cause or no cause without the murder being noticed, for he is only a Tigoiner. Gender also contributed to the conditions of slaves. As in other slaveholding societies, Enslavers had power over female slaves, leading to rape and abuse. As Colson wrote in his journal, documented by Ian Hancock, in the evening, the master makes his choice among the beautiful girls. Maybe he will offer some of them to the guests. While Romani women were used as sexual objects, some Romani men were castrated by their enslavers. Enslavers often subjected female adolescents to sexual abuse. Delia Grigore and other authors suggest a reason for the practice of early marriage in some Romanian Romani families. Perhaps during slavery, the families arranged for their virgin daughters to marry young as a way to protect them from sexual abuse by the enslavers. Cultural sociologists would call this a cultural or social adaptation to racism or oppression. Enslavers would decide on marriages between slaves or between slaves and serfs, although, as I mentioned earlier, laws sometimes prohibited such unions and regulations varied across time. For instance, in a deed written in 1674 and published by Adrian Fortuna, a Romanian woman marrying a Roman slave declared, I, Dina, gave my deed to the Holy Cross to be known that by taking Fiera, a gypsy of Valle monastery, into marriage with my free will, I willingly and without any constraint became the slave of the Holy Cross monastery. I also promised with my good will and without any constraint that all my children I would have shall belong as slaves to the Holy Cross monastery. The category of slaves also determines the condition of slavery. In the Romanian principalities, various criteria were used to distinguish between slaves. One was the difference between sedentary and nomadic slaves. Nomadic slaves were allowed to travel, but were bound to enslavers by obligations and taxes. Slaves were also distinguished as slaves of the crown and later of the state, slaves of the church and slaves of the boyars. Historians argue that the slaves of the crown were treated better than those in the other categories, and slaves of the church who were servants or craftsmen may have been treated better than slaves on estates in villages. 
But perhaps we cannot conclude that one category of slaves was always treated better than another. As Peterson shows, various factors may have contributed to the development of different types of relationships between enslavers and enslaved people. It was important, for instance, where the slaves lived, whether they were bought or born in the residence of the enslavers, their proximity to enslavers, and the personality of enslavers. For instance, where the slaves lived could have functioned as a source of either strength or weakness, depending on the enslaver. Skills and crafts also played a part in determining the condition of Romani slaves. Manual slaves, such as blacksmiths or locksmiths, seem to have been valued more and treated better. The hypothesis could be connected with Panaitescu's theory that some value was put on such skills given the lack of specialized blacksmith labor in the Romanian principalities. And that was not unique to Roma slavery. As Peterson points out, Greece also relied a lot on skilled craftsmen for its urban industries. And this fact more than any other determined the character of Greek slavery. And finally, Romani people themselves were not totally passive about their condition. They adapted, strategized, or reacted to the condition of slavery in different ways. Given the time limitation, I will only mention the revolt of the Netochi Roma. They were semi-nomadic Roma who escaped their enslavers and moved into the Carpathian Mountains. But in the times of slavery, those who resisted enslavement were portrayed as the worst kind of Roma, and also incapable of adapting, as Giulietta Rotari would mention. In the 19th century, Alexandru Paspati described Netochi as, and I quote, half savage, half naked, living by theft and rapine, Feeding in times of want upon cats, dogs, and mice, they are the most degraded and debased of all gypsy population. Yet the Roman scholar Ian Hancock described them as the true heroes of the enslaved Roman people. Finally, in looking at slavery as an institutional process, I like to mention a few methods of manumission or circumstances in which Roman slaves could gain their freedom. There are very few records of Roman slaves who were set free, but it was sometimes done through a will. Petra Petskut gives a few examples. For instance, in May 1634, an enslaver wrote in his will that upon the death of himself and his wife, Marga Tudora and her children should be set free. There are also a few records of slaves set free due to the good behavior or non-slaves buying the freedom of their enslaved uh, spouses. But not much has been written about the status of those freed people, including their prestige or acceptance in their community, their honor or the mistreatment. And having mentioned prestige and honor, let me now move to slavery as a personal relation which Orlando Peterson describes, and I quote, as the permanent, violent domination of natally alienated and generally dishonored persons. He argues that the concept and the practice of property are central in understanding slavery, but honor, alienation, and social debt are equally important. Romani people were coerced into the system of chattel enslavement beginning in the 1370s or perhaps earlier. The enslavers saw and treated Romani people a little bit better than animals, as an English diplomat visiting Romania during slavery wrote. In two of the history of Roma enslavement, the enslavers continued the paradoxical practice of using their power over the slaves as objects of property and at the same time treating slaves as persons in law, and more important for this part of our conversation, as persons with moral responsibility or trustful people. 
Romani women were denied humanity when punished and abused by enslavers, yet seen as trusted beings to breastfeed and raise their children. The enslavers imposed their authority over Romani slaves, not only through laws and church regulations, but also by misrepresenting the Roma as outsiders, criminals, inferiors, and non-persons. Social debt, as defined by Peterson, occurred through representing slaves both as external outsiders and outsiders within. The slave was an external intruder and an internal exile. The Romani slave was treated at the same time as a valuable commodity, a degraded and marginal human being, and an integral part of a household, a person kept in proximity. The historian Mihail Kogelnichanu, the most determined Romanian abolitionist in the 1800s, described the treatment of Romani slaves as follows. Cruel beatings and other punishments, such as starvation, being hung over smoking fires, solitary imprisonment, and being thrown naked into the snow or the frozen rivers, such was the fate of the wretched gypsy. The Roman had no alternative to enslavement, humiliation, and dishonor in their form of being subject with property, dignity, and integrity. Their only options were death and escape, that, like other examples Peterson provides in slavery and social debt, enslavers had uh, complete power over Roman slaves. But in addition, like many other enslaved peoples, the Roma were also denied humanity and honor. The institution of slavery ended in 1855 in Moldova and 1856 in Wallachia. After the final act of abolition in 1856, the 250,000 Romani slaves who became legally free, a full 7% of the Romanian population, received no reparations for the inhuman treatment they had suffered. As also happened on other continents, after five centuries of exploitation, the abusers received monetary compensation for freeing their Romani slaves, and they benefited further from the legacy of slavery by exploiting the cheap Romani workforce, as many newly freed Roma had to settle and work on the lands of former enslavers. Beyond former abolition, the actual transition from the status of slaves to free people was very slow. For instance, my great-grandparents, Maria Nicolae and Maria Anghita, married in June 1906 in my village in southern Romania. A full half century after abolition, their marriage certificate stated that they were emancipated Romanians. In the language of those times, emancipated Romanians meant former Romani slaves. And the term remained in the books for two to three more generations after the abolition. Today, the Romanians like to think that slavery is something in our distant past. But for my family and many other Romani families in Romania, only the past three or four generations were not stamped as slaves or former slaves. And to date, reparations for slavery have not been made. And this leads me to the last section of my lecture. In a recent chapter for our Time for Reparations volume, Jacqueline Baba and I suggested eight ways to repair the harm of state-sponsored injustices. In the specific case of Roma enslavement, we suggest five forms of reparation. Truth telling, memorializing resistance, apology, compensation, and reform at the legal, policy, cultural, political, and economic level. We intentionally chose truth telling as a concept to encompass the broad variety of actions that are needed and possible to ensure memorialization and remembrance. The concept of truth-telling signals the importance of presenting an accurate account of the history without minimizing the experience of enslavement. A simple example would be pointing out that the enslaved were not the same as the peasant serfs 
the field of history is supposed to be objective, describing not only world victories and heroes, but also painful episodes like the enslavement. The truth about Roma's labor is not yet being told. The truth about Roma's labor is not told enough. The truth about Roma's labor is not accurate enough. And the state institutions and the Orthodox Church play a critical role in this this memory approach. It is not enough for Roma to remember. It is a matter of injustice for Romanians to forget. And I say that not in an effort to remain stuck in the past, but rather to use the past to grieve, heal, accept guilt, draw lessons, understand structural inequalities, break racial prejudice, shape the future, and balance power. Several concrete steps towards truth-telling will help to generate broader public awareness along with better policies and engagement with the history of the enslavement, the enslavers, and the enslaved. Revised history textbooks, publication of complete historical records, creation of public memorials, the symbolic renaming of some city landmarks after Romani resistors and victims, and exhibition and other educational activities, are needed to generate broader public awareness of and engagement with these issues. Also of vital importance are open, easy, and digital access to archival information about slaves, careful revision of history books, relevant memorials, and public acknowledgement. In complete past efforts to address truth-telling, such as the Romanian Commission on Enslavement, need to be reestablished. Romania has to launch a new independent Roma-led national commission to study the legacy of the Roma enslavement and propose measures on reparations. Equally important is memorializing the resistance of both Romani people and their non-Romani allies. Stories of resistance send a strong message of power, of speaking up, and dignity. That is why the stories and history of the Netochi Roma must be researched and told. Another significant element is the role of non-Roma in the resistance and in abolishing enslavement, as well as in fighting other forms of state-sponsored injustices. These stories are relevant because in practice, they can have a lot of influence in convincing other non-Roma with more access to privileged and power spaces to join the fight against racism. The participation and support of non-Roma in fighting injustice should be a moral responsibility of our common societies. Romanian state institutions and the Orthodox Church have failed to issue a formal apology for the history of enslavement. Apologies should be done in a straightforward manner by expressing regret, requesting forgiveness, acknowledging and admitting the harm, and accepting responsibility. And it is self-evident that the history of 500 years of economic exploitation stripped Romani people of any prospect of accumulating intergenerational wealth. Thus, the state and the church have a responsibility to mitigate that wealth gap. Also, for five centuries, Roma were coerced into forced, uncompensated labor. For instance, the Kashin Monastery in Baku was built in the 1650s by 800 Romani slaves. Does we suggest the state provide compensation in the form of money and land to the descendants of Romani slaves? and also make collective financial compensations in a variety of other forms, including housing, healthcare, education and scholarship, research, and funding for the arts. Finally, legal, social, cultural, and economic reforms are needed to reduce the legacy of enslavement and ensure an anti-racist approach and preventive measures to forestall further harm. To conclude my lecture, I would like to leave you with an old Romani saying that Ian Hancock, 
documented in his book, Pariah Syndrome. He who wants to enslave you will never tell you the truth about your forefathers. Con mangel te querel tu mendar, roburen. Chi so hapene la tu men o chachimos patumare peritonde. Thank you very much. Nice to care.